President of the United States and the Vice President. Bread and butter. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, not knowing whether the press is friendly or unfriendly, <laughs> before I say anything else, I'm going to introduce my good friend here for a few words to you, Vice President George Bush. Thank you very much. What, what I wanted to do is just make a very brief comment on the recent trip that I took to Europe and so many people being interested in that. The mission was twofold, one to consult and to report back to the president uh, the innermost feelings of the, of the leaders of Europe uh, on the whole question of negotiations and reductions of intermediate nuclear forces. We, pr we disproved the adage that nothing can be done without leakage because the, the trip did work out so that I could respectfully knock on the door of the Oval Office and walk in there and tell the President the innermost feelings of seven European leaders and never having read anything about it before I had a chance to report to him in the press. So I, I hope we didn't uh, make your work too difficult, but it, it, it really brought home to me that consultation like that can be important and it gave the President an opportunity to shape his remarks, his important remarks before the German elections. We're careful not to intervene therein, but needless to say, the, the victory of Chancellor Kohl uh, with his support for the alliance was a significant thing for the West and I think for, for our objective of, of arms reductions because I think strongly feel that the President is, is on this proper path in order to achieve them. The second part of the the trip, in addition to the consultation, was the advocacy of a highly moral arms position, banning an entire generation of weapons from the face of the earth. And the only argument that was used against that, incidentally, on this trip was, well, the Soviets don't like it. They won't agree to it. But what we found was that the President's original zero option speech elevated the hopes of Europe. And then time went by and Soviet propaganda started and, and the, the support diffused. So it was interesting how a trip could seem to rally support for a fundamentally sound position. And we made clear it wasn't a take it or leave it position, uh, but I do think it had the, had, the, had the good point of emphasizing that our alliance was together that we have a sound position, a morally sound one, that every kid that's out there with a the sign really should be supporting. And it was wonderful to be advocating that. There were a few demonstrators, but the last thing I want to say is that on the right hand fender, you know, of the, of the car, when you take an official trip like this, the American flag is, is flying on that fender. And you, I, you know, I've been around crowds a fair amount, and you can tell that there was strong enthusiasm everywhere we went. There were some demonstrators, but they weren't even as hostile as we encounter right here at home sometimes, you know. So, <laughs> so I just wanted you to know that because it was a thrill of my life to be in Berlin or in Rome or someplace. See, an alliance that's pretty strongly, well, very strongly together, an alliance that, that uh, is absolutely essential, incidentally, to the freedom that we treasure and also to the, to being together to, to, for arms reduction, and then just the thrill of seeing the, the American flag and the respect that it still has abroad. So I wanted to give you that insight into what was a, uh, I hope for this country, a productive trip. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. And I will say to you what he wouldn't say about the trip. Believe me, when George came back from Europe, the alliance was much more solid and on a sound basis. He did a magnificent job over there. Now, it's good to have you all here today. You know that political consultants are always telling us, us in politics, to get our message out to the weeklies and the dailies across the country because they're the publications that everybody pays the most attention to, the ones that are read from cover to cover. 
so I didn't want to let the opportunity go by without <laughs> mentioning to you a few developments that haven't always gotten as much ink as they deserve, by way certainly of the metropolitan papers we read here in Washington. Last week I suggested that the medium should talk more about the good news. And since then, a lot of people have asked me, well, what good news is there? <laughs> and I'm going to be very happy to tell you. Uh, maybe some of you might even find it worthy of a sentence or two. After only a year and a half of our economic recovery program, it is starting to pay off for every American. All the hostiles to it named it Reaganomics. If it works, I wonder what they're going to call it. Uh, <laughs> But the leading indicators, economic indicators, are up now for eight of the last 10 months, and the last month's increase was the largest single increase in 33 years. We've licked inflation by bringing it down from double digits to an annualized rate for the last six months of 1.4%. Interest rates have come down a whole 11 points from the 21.5% before we got here and down to the 10.5% today. The auto and steel industry beginning to expand. Housing is skyrocketing. Economist after economist is saying that the recovery is now upon us. And I just read an item today that steel has called back 20,000 laid off workers. The stock market is setting new record highs. In seven months, it's gained 350 points. And most of all, real wages were up in 1982 for the first time in three years. We got the economy back on track by reversing the whole momentum, I think, of the last four or five decades of government. And for the first time in nearly 20 years, the people have received a substantial tax cut. The third installment is due on July 1st, and then comes indexing. and. I would say to you that those who are talking about canceling those over my dead body, but I know they'd take me up on that. <laughs> we've, we've actually slowed the upward spiral of growth in federal spending by 40%, and our reforms of big spending items in the budget, like entitlement programs, are just beginning to have some impact. And you may know that our cutbacks in federal regulations have reduced new regulations by a full one-third, and the chairman of the task force who has been doing that is standing right here to my right. Uh, I think we, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think paperwork on all the people of this country re, that was required because of those regulations has been reduced by about 300 million man-hours of work a year. So besides tax cuts and spending cuts and the deregulation efforts, the change in perspective that has been brought to the federal bureaucracy is just as important. For a long idea, time, the idea of the Fed that was that federal dollars were the property of the bureaucrats, not the taxpayers, and that idea went unchallenged around this town. Those who pointed to the misuse of those dollars were looked upon as malcontents or troublemakers. And uh, we decided to change this, if we could, at the General Services Administration, for example, once racked by stories of scandal and waste. We've put the whistleblowers back in charge. And even though GSA has sustained budget cuts of 20 percent and an attrition of 7,000 employees, its work in progress time has been cut from 30 days to seven. Maybe before they got rid of the other people, they were just getting in each other's way. And uh, at the general printing office, we turned a three-year loss of $20 million in publications into a profit over $4 million last year. And at the Pentagon, we've located more than a billion dollars in savings and waste. And over the next seven years, we'll save almost $30 billion from multi-year procurement and other acquisition initiatives. The list goes on. Our inspector generals have saved or improved the use of nearly $17 billion in 18 months. And I can tell you, we have inspector generals that are as mean as junkyard dogs. And we're going to keep them that way. And, 
the Reform 88, as we call it, is streamlining and modernizing the maze of federal financial and accounting systems. And our private sector project has brought hundreds of experts from outside government to look at the federal departments and agencies with an eye toward efficiency and cost cutting, telling us how modern business practices could be put to work in government. And I was just wondering how many of you know that I'm in a publishing business also. I'm, in fact, I stand atop a publishing empire that's bigger than Gannett's. Uh, the federal, the, the uh, federal government spends millions of dollars a year on publications of every conceivable kind and size. The Federal Register alone has doubled in a decade. And cutting back on the unnecessary publications is one of the things that we focused on from the beginning of our administration. And over 2,300 publications, or almost 20% of all government publications, have been eliminated. Now, these publications represent 70 million copies of unneeded or wasteful federal publications that won't be printed. And I think you can imagine the kind of savings that that will mean to the taxpayer. And in the area of foreign affairs, we've moved a long way, as George was telling you, from the time of invasion of Afghanistan, of hostages in Iran, and retreat in the face of threats from small-time dictators and totalitarian powers. I believe this new note of realism in our foreign policy has made the path toward peace an easier one. In fact, for the first time now, as George told you, we're negotiating not limitations on the increase in weapons, but on the actual reduction in nuclear arms, and we're going to stay in those negotiations until we get a, a result. I think all of this means that Americans today feel better about their country. They believe that we have a plan and a strategy for policies both home and abroad, and we do. But it's important to keep in mind that our whole effort was not geared just to higher gross national product or stronger stock market, but the expansion of personal freedom and opportunity. Lifting the stifling hand of government is leading to economic prosperity, but it's also encouraging personal freedom in every sphere. And it stimulates the initiative, ingenuity, and the striving for excellence that have always been trademarks of the American people. I hope that those of you with a vested interest in the rights of free speech will keep in mind that freedom really is indivisible. There isn't any S in that word. Any government that tries to restrict economic freedom, freedom of the individual, can be just as casual about other personal freedoms, some of them very important to people like yourselves, like the right to a free press. And that's been our goal. The expansion of freedom coupled with the hope of making life a little more rewarding for people like yourselves and those who read your publications. I mean the hard workers, the entrepreneurs, the millions of Americans who take quiet pride in a daily job well done. If I'm not being too boastful, it indicates that we've tried to keep a promise that brought us into office, a promise to make government work for the people, to restore their faith in our political institutions by making sure that government acts as the servant and not the master of a people. I want to close with a very pleasant duty I have to perform here. Dean Lesher, where are you? Dean. <coughs> Dean High, how are you? Thank you. Very, 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 you stand right here. I know. Yes. I, uh, Dean Lesher is known to all of you, I know, as the most distinguished member of the newspaper and media fraternity. As chairman of Lesher Communications, he's shown that he is not only a first rate businessman, but a man who, too, who cares about the quality of his editorial product and the people who produce it. But Dean is known to me in another way, because as governor of California, I called upon him three times to serve the people of the state, including a term as a trustee of the California State University system. So it gives me a great deal of pleasure to present this award to a man who has been a success in both the private and public sectors. And now I shall the citation reads, this award is presented to Dean S. Lesher with the sincere appreciation of the officers, directors, and members of the National Newspaper Association in recognition of the long and distinguished leadership that he has provided to the newspaper industry. Through steadfastly upholding the highest principles of journalism, faithfully serving the readers of his newspapers, 
and unswervingly seeking excellence in all of his endeavors, Dean S. Lesher has consistently and conscientiously proven his distinguished leadership role in the newspaper industry. Congratulations. Now, I've looked around here, and I know that it's going to be absolutely impossible to mingle and mix and have a dialogue uh, with all of you. And since some of your employees get to now and then throw questions at George and me, you didn't know I was going to include you in that, did you? Uh, I just thought that maybe at least for a few minutes here, if you aren't tired of hearing from us, uh, you might like to ask a question or two yourself. President, what happened to the California weather after you left there? <laughs> I can tell you I was going to be very angry if it had gotten better. <laughs> but I had the worst experience a Californian could have. I left that whole full week of rain and wind and cyclone that tore roofs off in Los Angeles, came back here for three more days of rain back here, and then went down to Florida and had to admit I was seeing the first sunshine I had seen <laughs> in 10 days. <laughs> yes. I'm not supposed to tell the boss I'm going to the Kentucky Derby. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. I wish him well. I was there. Uh, I was there as a governor, and uh, I'm a. I'm to prove to you, I'm a real conservative. When we'd all sit around up there and try to guess in each race who was going to come in first and so forth, I waited till they got it down to two, and then I bet on both of them to place. <laughs> Well, we will, of course, be appointing a director, and I'm glad you asked, because, uh, because I, ha I have to tell you, frankly, I think that this has been disgraceful. And I think when Ann Ger Burford came to me, and it was, I would never have asked her to resign, although I bled for her and what she was taking. But she resigned simply because she said, I believe it will be impossible for the agency to continue working unless I do. And we had made available virtually everything that was required or requested of us uh, to the Congress. And all we were hearing was, were accusations and allegations and innuendos. And she herself was the one who wanted above all to give them anything that they wanted because she felt confident enough. She's done a darn good job and we've done a darn good job environmentally since we've been here. And, uh, we're not going to let her leave the administration. She'll have another job. All right. All right. All right. All right. Mr. President, as a Californian, I'm proud that you uh, exported uh, our economics uh, to Washington. But I am concerned as a parent. Tell us about your plans for San Salvador. I don't want to see another Vietnam. No, you're not going to see another Vietnam. And there is no resemblance. Uh, between these two and what the situation is. I just made a speech to the National Association of Manufacturers this noon on this entire subject. The El Salvador, what we're seeing down there, if you look at that map of Central America and see Nicaragua now on the mainland here on, in Central America as the same kind of a puppet that Cuba is, and they are exporting this revolution to Nicaragua. Those aren't peasants that are not sending advisors that will be up there uh, with them in any combat. We have been helping them train. So far, we've only been able to help them train about one out of 10 of their men. And the battalions that we have trained are uh, doing a, a fine job. We, we have to call attention to the fact that this government of El Salvador, yes, they have a long way to go. They've got a 50-year history of military dictatorships. But this is a government that was elected last March in an, an election by the people. And this government has moved up and advanced the election of a president from next year to this year. 
They have appointed a peace commission to see if they cannot persuade some of these people to lay down their arms and come in with full amnesty and participate in the democratic process in this election. But I think the proof of their country came last March in the election. We had a team of observers down there from the Congress, some of them who were opposed to our aid to El Salvador. And the guerrillas, and you know that there had been a worldwide propaganda attack that the guerrillas really represented the people of El Salvador and that somehow it was the government that was the enemy. But it was the guerrillas who said to the people of El Salvador, we'll kill you if you vote. And one grandmother stood in that line and told our congressman that she had been told that she and her family would be killed. And she said to the guerrillas, you can kill me, you can kill the family. You can't kill us all. We'll vote. And they went, they, they destroyed over 200 buses and trucks to try and keep people from the polls. But they walked to the polls. They stood for as long as eight and 10 hours in line waiting to vote. One woman was shot by a, the guerrillas and refused to leave the line for treatment until she had voted. More than 80% of them went to the polls. We haven't had in more than half a century 80% of our electorate go to the polls when there's no one threatening them and it's only around the corner to, to vote. But they did that and they, they have, their land reform program has been extended now for another five years. 25,000 farm workers have become farm owners under this plan. We think they deserve help, but mainly we think we're helping ourselves because to the south of them is the Panama Canal, to the north of them is Mexico with an 1800 mile border on our country that doesn't have a single armed guard of any kind because of the long years of peace between us. This will expand to Honduras, to Guatemala, to Costa Rica, and they are the ones who told me on my trip down there that they knew it would, that this was a regional thing to get that sector in the middle there and bring the Soviet type of rule into the Western Hemisphere. And what I said in Central and South America when I was there was, I know that the Colossus to the North, us, we've presented ideas before, but I was- Newspaper men in Honduras recently, embassy, American embassy people there pointed out that 90,000 plus tons of sugar is their allotment in Nicaragua to sell to the United States, that the Nicaraguan Marxist government is taking that American money and buying weapons from Cuba and the Soviet Union to use against El Salvador and to use against Honduras. Mr. President, is that the right way for us to buy sugar in Central America? No, and we're going to do something about it. Gene Kirkpatrick came back with the same message, <laughs> and something will be done about it. Uh, I know that I've there's so many hands, that, but I haven't taken anyone from this side. I just take this one, and then this has to be the last. I just, then someday, someday, George, we're going to find that wherever it is that they give us that piece of paper every day that tells us what we're doing every 15 minutes <laughs> of the day. But yes. Well, like any compromise, no one is completely happy with it. No one's really happy with it. But what we have done is remove the fiscal threat that was hanging over it. We can guarantee that the checks are going to go out. And I think that all in all, uh, I think it was worth voting. And the amendment that was put on uh, yesterday extending after the year 2000, uh, the age, the minimum age limit from 65 to 67 to be phased in over a several year period, I think is a good sound idea also. And I was delighted to see it passed because that was one political football that we needed to get kicked out of the stadium so we could get on with the business of government. And it's gone. Well, now I... I, I when you announce your re-election? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'll answer that. You know, the, the, well, it's going to be 50-50. Uh, no, I'll tell you. The, I think there's a time and place uh, for that decision to be made and to be announced. If you do it too early, you're a lame duck if you go one way. And uh, if you uh, do it the other way, then everything you try to do, you're accused of doing it for political purposes. And besides, I've always believed that uh, 
If you wait a while, the people tell you whether you should run again or not.